We're looking at eight recovery principles based on the Word of God, and they're in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Notice the next screen on your monitor there. Some of the struggles and issues that people are dealing with. I think many of us in this service this morning can probably relate to at least one of those. Issues, hurts, and habits, and hang-ups that mess with our life. Every one of us, every one of us knows somebody that's hurting because of a past hurt or habit or hang-up that they're having to deal with. Now, this is the good news. The good news is no matter what the problem, no matter what the issue, the solution is always the same. We have one that can come to our rescue. And that's what all of these message, messages will talk about during these next several weeks. April the 3rd, we'll kick off Celebrate Recovery. That's when we're launching. And the purpose of that ministry is to help people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I'm praying that many of you will participate in this ministry as well. But it's going it, to... It's going to take a sacrifice on your part. Many of us don't want to admit that we have a problem. But I want you to understand that you've got to admit it or the solution will never come. I think you're going to have to backtrack that and then start again. I want you to watch this video about baggage. Baggage. For as long as we've had stuff, we found ways to bring it along. Baggage started off big. But it got smaller, portable. Now one person can carry more than ever. Important stuff like clothes, toiletries, fancy little dogs, you know, necessities. But what's amazing is how much stuff we drag around that we don't need and don't like. Things that trip us up, wear us out, and box us in. Stuff like anger. What is wrong with you? Addiction. Overeating and overspending. It was amazing. They had such great sales. I couldn't believe it. We carry around past relationships. I don't know what I ever saw in you. I didn't even dress well. Gosh. Worry. Unforgiveness. And selfishness. I think that's a great idea, don't you? I love it. It makes us ask questions like, why did I do that? Or how did I get here? What is wrong with me? Because this stuff is heavy. It's bulky. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It makes everything in life harder, especially relationships. You might not know where it came from or how you got it, but there's only one way to deal with baggage. Throw it down. Drop it. Just let go. Sounds easy, but it's not. You carry something long enough, it feels like a part of you. You walk away, but a minute later, it's back in your hand. Baggage tricky like that. You gotta keep dropping, keep throwing, keep letting go, so you can take hold of something better. God's best for your life. And for that, you're gonna need both hands. Celebrate recovery. Real help for life's baggage. Meeting soon at a church near you. What kind of baggage are you carrying around? What kind of baggage do you need to let go of? The first step in recovery is simply the reality step. It's to realize that we are completely powerless to control the tendency to do wrong. Our life is unmanageable. Well, that first step is hard. The second step is this. That's the hope step. I believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, and that He has the power, and He alone has the power to help me to recover. See, step one says I can't. 
Step two says, He can. Step one says, I'm, I'm helpless, I'm powerless. Step two says, there is hope and there is power in Jesus Christ. Now we come to the third step that I want to focus in on this morning. And the third step is simply this. I commit all my life and all of my will to Jesus' care and to his control. This is, a, this, is a, um, this is a step that's got to be reached. There must come a time that, we'll, that we realize we can't, he can, and we commit to his care to manage our life. It's time that we need to change managers. I've heard, we have all seen those bumper stickers, I suppose, that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. That's the problem with most people. You need to move over and let him become the pilot, not the co-pilot of your life. Now, notice this picture on the screen. I think we can relate to this. We have a, we have a tendency to get stuck in life. Now, this old boy right here, he's in trouble. He is stuck, and he cannot get out. But listen to me, I know people that are worse than him, and you do as well, do you not? People that are stuck in their hurts and their habits and their hang-ups. They're stuck in their grief. They're stuck in their anger. I've never seen so many angry people in my life. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Larry and I, we, there was a guy we saw and we stopped and we thought we was going to have to break up a fight. It was pretty hard. And then yesterday, yeah, it was yesterday, I was uh, going down um, Spencer and right there at Spencer in Pasadena Boulevard. Man, there was a guy that jumped out of his car. He was ready to whoop the world. We live in a world where people are stuck, stuck with their anger and their grief, their bitterness. People are stuck in their addictions and their past hurts. I know multitudes of people that were hurt when they were little and they can't seem to get past it. I know multitudes of people that have been hurt through a relationship or through a marriage and they can't seem to get past it. Now when you get stuck, let me share, share with you what normally happens, and I think many of you will be able to relate to what I'm about to share with you. When you get stuck in the areas that I've talked about this morning, you begin to feel guilty that you're stuck. And then after the guilt feeling comes the anger. The anger because you can't seem to change. It seems like it's the same thing every day. And you just can't seem to change. And then the anger soon turns to fear. Because you begin to get afraid that your life will be like this forever. That you just cannot get out of this thing that you're stuck in. And then after that, after the, the guilt and the anger and the fear comes depression. Amen. You become, begin to realize, be, uh, let me just say this, you begin to think that there just is no hope. There's no hope for change. Well, how do you break free? How do you break free from these hurts and these habits and these hang-ups, how do you break free? How do you get unstuck? Well, that fellow that was in the seat a while ago, he could not get out by himself, and you can't either. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we've been talking about the last several weeks. That's what Celebrate Recovery is going to be all about. The purpose of these messages is to give you and your friends and your family and your neighbors, and your co-workers, people that you, that you deal with on a daily basis, it's to give them hope. But not only others, but yourself as well. Now, here it is. This is how it works. 
Step one is simply this. I admit that I'm powerless to control and manage my life. That's a reality step. Step two is realize that Jesus has the power to help me, that he cares for me, that he can manage my life. He knows all about me. He knows what you're going through. Maybe no one else does, but he knows. He cares about you. He wants to help you. It's not enough, however, just to know that God will. It's got to believe that he will. It's one thing to know because we've seen him help so many other people. Now, how many of you have been in this position? You look around and everybody else is getting relief, but you're not. And you actually begin to think, does God even care? Maybe, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. My friend, there must come a time that you take an action. You've got to make a decision. And that brings us to the third step. Commit all my life and my will to Jesus' care and to con for his, him to begin to control my life. That's the commitment step. Now, this step is based on what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. You're welcome to turn over there. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and verse 30, a powerful message here in this chapter. Jesus makes this statement. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest. Unto your souls. I feel led just to pause right here and say a prayer. Father. I know that there's probably someone in this service here today or maybe we'll hear the message later that are hurting and they've, they've just about given up. They just can't see no light. Please speak to them through this message. Help them to be willing to go to this third step. Help them to understand that they can't, he can, and then help them to commit. Please, Father, wrap your arms around these people here today and show them that you love them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In this verse of Scripture, Jesus says, I know your problems. He says, I know that you're heavy burdened. But he says, come to me. Come to me and I will lighten your load. I will set you free. I will give you rest. Give me control and care of your life. And he says, I will make life easier and less stressful. What a deal. Amen. What a deal. Why would anyone pass up that deal? But how many have heard this message before and they have passed up? I remember when I was struggling seriously for, gosh, it was about six years. And many times God worked to get my attention. Many times, and people would try to help. But I'd just about given up. Praise God, I finally woke up. And it's, there's mo most likely people in this congregation this morning that need to wake up. You see, this is like having an un 
unopened gift. And, and I, I meant to take the time this morning. I wanted to use it as an illustration. I wanted to put a real big expensive gift up here on the table. Real expensive. And you, most of you understand why I did not do that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I wanted to do that. We have a priceless gift, my friend. And unfortunately, it is unopened by many people. The gift will serve no purpose until it is received and opened. When people, let me ask you, what keeps people from surrendering their life? What keeps people from, some, from surrendering their life to the care and to the control of Jesus? I shared with you the deal earlier. I mean, it just looks like it's a no-brainer to me. But what keeps people from receiving the help that Jesus truly wants to give? I want to share with you about four things. Number one is pride. Pride will keep us from admitting that we need help. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Pride takes too many people down the road to destruction. Again, you and I have met many people like that, and probably some of you that are here this morning. You fall in that category, and pride keeps you from getting the help that you know that you need, but you're just too prideful to admit that you have the problem. Now, I've got a question just for the ladies, and this is just for the ladies. Ladies, how many of you know a man who is too prideful to even ask for help or ask for directions? <laughs> uh, let's see. Everybody raised their hand but Linda, I think. We, yeah, men are bad in this area. Boy, we'll travel all day long before we stop and ask for directions. We're just, you know, I mean, I'm going to admit that I'm lost. I've never been lost. I just... Didn't quite figure out where I was. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 8 says, The wise are glad to be instructed. I love that scripture. The wise are glad to be instructed, but fools fall flat on their faces. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. When the pain becomes greater than the fear of change, when the pain becomes greater than the fear of change, then we'll be ready to submit to change. I'm afraid that some of you just need a, another dose of pain. But you don't have to get another dose. I want you to understand that it, God does not take pleasure in your pain. He does not want you to suffer. But I also want you to know that sometimes, let me rephrase again, Sometimes pain comes from God. And it's really a good thing. Pain can really be a, a great thing. I'm, I met a man um, Friday night. Uh, he had a boot on his foot. And I said, what's wrong with your foot? And he began to give me all the medical terms, the problem that he had. But something's wrong with him and his bones will break. And he said, the problem with that is this. I'm a diabetic. I'm a very serious diabetic. And when the bones break, I do not feel it. I feel no pain in my foot. Well, some of you might say, that's a great thing not to have, have pain, but that's a bad thing. Because he keeps doing more damage as a result of it. The second thing that I want to mention, why, what keeps people from surrendering their life and care to, to Christ is guilt. We all have a lot of things that causes us guilt. We feel guilty because many of us have asked God for help hundreds of times, making promises at the same time, and it seems like we've just broke the promises. God, if you just get me out of this problem, I will. God, if you just fix this, I will. God, if you just do this, I will. And it gets to the point where we just feel guilty and guilty and guilty to the extent that we don't want to go to God anymore because... We haven't kept our side of the bargain. Listen to me carefully. God loves you so much. It makes no difference how many times 
you have broke your promise to God. He takes joy in repentance. Amen. And you can stop feeling guilty if God's Holy Spirit is help, leading you to seek help. You can stop feeling guilty and reach out to Him and He will help you. The third thing is fear. I could talk a lot about fear. I'm afraid what I might have to give up. Now let's admit it. I'm afraid what I might have to give up for change. Did you hear the story about the fella? Uh, he fell off of a real steep cliff. And it was about a thousand feet fall. But, but about halfway down, he was able to grab a hold of a limb. And as he was hanging on to that limb, man, he looked up and it's about 500 feet up there and 500 feet down and he cries out, Would somebody help me? Please, somebody help me. And a voice said, Let go of the limb and I will catch you. Who is that? It is God. Just let go of the limb, and I will catch you. And he thought for a few moments, and he said, Is anybody else up there? <laughs> Sometimes, my friend, we just must trust God. Let me rephrase that. It, we must always trust God for the help. And even in the fear, we must trust God. Lack of trust causes a lot of fear. Let me ask you a personal question. This is just for you. Do you trust God enough to let go? And let God. Some fear control. They don't want anybody controlling them. How many people want somebody to tell us what to do? How many people want somebody else to control their life? But let me tell you what freedom really is. Now, this is what, in my, in my opinion, this is what freedom really is. Having the choice who's going to control you. Freedom is deciding who your master is going to be. Is your master that, that addiction that you're faced with? Is your master that relationship? Is your master that anger, that pain, that hurt, that habit? Who is your master? You say, well, I'm not going to let anybody control me. You already are. And you have the fear? Jesus said, John 8, 36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Another prob problem that we have concerning fear is the fear of loss. We're afraid what we're going to lose. Well, Jesus makes this statement in Mark 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit if you shall keep what you got but lose your life as you keep what you got? I know saved people. By the way, that soul there actually does mean life. It's your inner being. But it's more than just your eternal soul. It's your entire life. I know saved people that are destroying their life because of a hurt or habit or a hang up. And for whatever the reason may be, they're afraid that if they change, they will lose. My friend, you will always win if you change and accept God. Amen. You'll never lose. And then there's the fear of how will it work? <laughs> what about the details? Now listen carefully. Because this may be where you are. And I know you know somebody that this, this is where they are. Some confuse decision, decision making with problem solving. In 1963, John Kennedy, the president of the United States... He made this decision and he shared it with the public. He said, we will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. 
Let me ask you a question. Had all the details already been worked out? Absolutely not. My friend, if you're waiting for all the details to be worked out before you make a decision, you are in trouble. If you're waiting for all the lights to turn green before you start your trip, you're not going to ever start your trip. In March of 1976, under the the direction of God, I made a major decision in my life. And that is when I surrendered to God's call to the ministry. I want you to know that I made a decision without looking at all the details. I had to. I had no, in fact, I go back to that date. I had no idea how God would do it. I couldn't hardly read. I couldn't hardly write. I couldn't speak. I had a very, you think I've got a speech problem now? You should have been there back in 1976. Serious, serious speech problem. I, I could, a lot of words I couldn't say. My kids would try to help me say words. <laughs> I could give you some examples, but I won't. But my point is this. Sometimes you just got to trust God with the details and make the decision to make the commitment. Don't worry about all the details that you're. How how will all this be? I don't know how I, I, I just don't understand how it can be. And then the fear of failure. Now, come on. Many of you are here. I don't think I can hold out. I just don't think I can do it. What if, what if I start and I fall and I, and I fail? I'm just afraid that I can't keep it. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, he said, there's a lot of things I don't understand. But one thing I do understand, he says, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. The cool thing about it is you don't have to worry about Holding out. He'll take care of it for you. And by the way. If you start on the journey. And you do fall on your face. All you do is get up and, and, and go again. It's not the end of the world. When you, when you have a relapse. Amen. You just get up. And you go again. He said in Philippians 1 6, been confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it. He will do it. It's not you, it's him. And then the last thing that keeps us from receiving the help of Jesus Christ is doubt. I want to believe, but I have so many doubts. Jesus tells a story about a father in the Bible whose child needed to be healed. And he goes to Jesus. And Jesus says, Do you believe that I can heal your son? And the father said this. And I'll paraphrase it. I want to believe, but I have so many doubts. Jesus said, that's good enough for me. And he healed his son. Man, I've had I've had so many doubts. Go back to 76. You don't think I had some doubts about ministry? Hmm? Brandon, you ever had any doubts about ministry? You ever had any doubts even about Sunday morning leading worship? Preaching? I should not admit this, but we are human. And one thing here at LifeBridge is we are real. I don't know what in the world was going on in my life a few weeks ago. But I was so bad on a Sunday morning. And I don't don't know. I was just dealing with some people and different things. And and fear crept, crept in. And I did not even want to preach. I'm talking about a moment or two before it's time for me to preach. Hmm. But God took over, amen. 
God took over. Maybe you need to say like this father said, I believe, but help me with my doubts. And Jesus will say, that's good enough. I will help you with your doubts. In conclusion, how do I take this third step? This third step, which is the reality step. How can I do this? Number one, this is, has to be number one. You must know Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, if you're trying to get past a hurt habit and hang up without knowing Jesus, you'll never be successful. Never. That is the very first step. You must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not just believing about God. It's not just coming to church. It's not living a good life. You must trust Jesus. He said, I am the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's the first step. You must accept Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does that mean? It means to commit as much of yourself to him at the moment that you understand about Jesus. Amen. I know little children that have been saved at the age of five, six, seven, eight years old. How much could they know? But they knew enough to trust. Number two, this is important. You must accept God's word as your standard for living. Truth of the matter is that this is what some of you are fighting. Amen. I know that the world teaches one thing and I know your friend says one thing and I, teens, I know you have a hard time with this as well. But you must accept God's word as the, T-H-E, the standard for your living. Folk, this is the instruction manual. This is the owner's manual. God wrote this for us. Amen. This is the manual that we must use. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Number three, you must accept God's will as your goal for life. Whew. That's another tough one. God's will. You don't have to understand it all. There's still a lot of stuff I don't understand. But I accept his will as my goal for life. And then number four, this is the one that really gets you through it. You must accept God's power as your strength. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. Is that what it says? It says a little bit more than that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, my friend, you don't have to. You don't have to do it. He will do it for you. I could stop right here and ask some folks to give some testimonies. We'll hear another testimony tonight. Susan will be giving her testimony tonight. I am truly looking forward to our testimonies. You don't have to do it. You just simply... Say, God, I'm here. You do what you need to do, and I will submit. So that's it. Sounds pretty simple. It's a great deal, amen? Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Accept the Bible as the standard for living. Accept God's will as your goal for life. And accept God's power as your strength. Is Jesus speaking to you today? What do you need to submit to him? The scripture said earlier that we read that, and it was, it was fantastic verse of scripture, that in, in, in Matthew chapter 11, 
Well, I don't even have the scripture here now, but come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And he says something about my, what do you say, my load is easy and light. I'll make your load easy and light. Yeah. He's ready. Are you? Are you? Notice the scripture on the screen. What it says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. Jesus will not open the door unless you... In my fact, he won't open the door. You must open it. He's knocking. But who has the key to the door? You do. But he's knocking. You're the one that's got to open the door. He will not push the door down. He will not bang on the door and say, let me in, let me in, let me in. He just knocks. And he asks for permission to come in. Why would anyone not grant him that permission? Would you stand very quietly, very reverently? Father, I know that you are speaking to people here today. I know. Father, there are many here today that are struggling. There will be those that will listen and watch this message later. Father, there's those that we know. Speak to us, God. Show us how we can surrender our life to your total care. Father, if there's someone here today that's never been saved, Father, I pray for that man, woman, boy, and girl. Help them to see that you are real. Help them to see that you want to help because you care. Help them to submit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we listen to this invitation, and there will be scriptures on the screen, I want you to look at those scriptures and as God begins to touch your heart,